1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let his or let each woman have her own husband. Uh, there's no uh, that's just the way it is, regardless of what the culture says. Verse three, it says, "Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband." And in verse four, it says, "The wife does not have authority over her, her own body, but the husband does." And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And in verse 5, it says, Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Verse 6, Paul says, I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. I believe that is pointed to verse 7. For I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. In verse 8, it says, but I say to the unmarried, and to the widows. It is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time this morning. And Lord, we pray that you would feed our hearts and our souls this morning as we come to your word, God. We pray, Lord, that you would convict areas of our lives that need conviction. Lord, we pray that you would heal marriages that need healing, Lord. We pray that you would encourage others that need encouragement, Lord. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You notice as we begin this morning in verse 1, Paul says, Now concerning the things that you wrote to me. Up until this point in the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul has been addressing issues within the congregation in that he had been informed by members of the church. And while away from Corinth, Paul received word that the church, in a sense, was in disarray. And therefore, he wrote them this letter of correction. And we have studied together through the first six chapters of the book of 1 Corinthians, and Paul had dealt with the sin that was being embraced in the congregation. To bring you up to speed, if you haven't been with us, in chapters 1 through 4, Paul pointed out that the church of Corinth was divided where they should have been united. And then when you get to chapters 5 and 6, Paul pointed out that they should have been divided where they were actually united united. Because in those chapters, in chapters 1 through 4, they were dividing over various leaders. They would say, well, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas or Peter. And then there was some that said, you know, we're not under the authority of men, we're under the authority of Jesus directly. And then when you get to chapter 5 and 6, you read about the sexual immorality that was taking place in the church. And evidently, there was a man that was sleeping with his stepmother, and having a, having a relationship of sexual immorality with her. And then the church apparently just seemed to emb- not only embrace it, but they, they tolerated it. And then they were proud of the fact that they tolerated the sexual sin in the church. And they were united in that. And Paul says, listen, you should be divided over that. That's not something to be proud of. And eventually he says, listen, if this guy's not going to repent, he says, throw him outside of the church and deliver him to Satan. Now, as we move into chapter 7 through 16, the Corinthian letter that Paul had written was more likely here in these chapters to answer specific questions. Various situations had arisen or has arisen within the church 
that needed godly counsel and wisdom and essentially biblical answers. When we, as we come to chapter 7, he will give answers as it relates to marriage. When we get to chapters 8 through 10, Paul gives answers as it relates to Christian liberty and what they could do and what they couldn't do. And then when we get to chapter 11, he will, he will give them answers about conduct within the church. And then chapters 12 through 14, he gives them answers about spiritual gifts that were to take place and how they were to operate in the church. And then in chapter 15, he gives us answers about the resurrection of the dead. And then chapter 16, giving an offering. Now, Paul had previously, as we mentioned, corrected the Corinthians who had approved of sexual intimacy in unbiblical circumstances. And now Paul is going to tell them the biblical way intimacy was to be used. And this morning, we want to look together at biblical principles that apply to our marriage. Notice in verse 1, Paul says, It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, the, here the word touch is used in the sense of having sexual relations. And this was more likely a statement that was made, you know, probably because some of the church members in Corinth, they were saying, they wrote to Paul and they said, is it, it's not good for a man to touch a woman sexually. And it prompted Paul an agreement from him without reservation saying, of course, it is not good when they were unmarried. But apparently, there seemed to be a group here within the church of Corinth that was abstaining from sexual relate for abstaining from sex, even to the point within their marriages. They had gotten married, and then they had taken a vow of celibacy, even though they were already married. And Paul was thinking, Paul was saying, "Well, of course, outside of marriage, it's that's that's proper. You there shouldn't be sexual relationships outside of marriage." But now he addresses inside of marriage. And think about this. You know, guys, if you get married and you go on your honeymoon and your wife says, well, I have good news and I have bad news. Um, we are married, but I've taken a vow of celibacy. <laughs> You'd say, wait, what? Either way. It just, either way, it would just be such a strange thing. And apparently there was this group in the church of Corinth that thought they were more spiritual from abstaining from sex with their spouse in a marriage relationship and taking a vow of celibacy. Now, it's interesting because the culture that we live in, if you ever noticed the devil works overtime to get people to have as many sexual relationships outside of marriage, but then when you enter into a covenant of marriage, when that individual is married, the devil unleashes an all-out assault to destroy the intimacy between a husband and a wife. And in much of this chapter, Paul is going to explain practical, biblical aspects of intimacy between a husband and a wife in regards to marriage. Notice in verse 2, he explains firstly whom marriage is among. He says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. It says there, let each man have his own wife and each woman have uh, her own husband. Now, there is no other way around that. And in light of the danger of sexual immorality ever present in the Corinthian culture and in our culture, Paul says it is appropriate for a husband and a wife to have each other in a sexual sense. Now, before we continue on, in the culture in which they were living, in the Roman culture in Corinth, there were four different types of marriage. The first marriage was a marriage that was between slaves because slavery was common in the Roman Empire. And what would happen was if two slaves wanted to be married, they would have to go to their master and then they would say the master would have to approve of their marriage. Another type of marriage, the second one was if a couple were living together for at least a year, they were considered married after that. The third type of marriage that Rome approved of was when a father sold his daughter 
to, off to a prospective suitor uh, and uh, for his wife to, and, she, and she would leave. The fourth one was most common to the day in which we live. It was a marriage ceremony, much like ours today, where the families would come together, they would participate, they would exchange vows, they would exchange rings, and so forth. And in the midst of all these marriages, there was a very high percentage of divorce. Some, some historians, I believe, have said that, that some people in Corinth were married as many as 20 times or more. It's just crazy to think about. And given the circumstances of Corinth with the pagan sexual immorality at the temple, Aphrodite, and the sex-saturated culture, there were various opinions on marriage. And there were multiple opinions as many as, or as well as many questions that were being raised by the Corinthians in this church. Now, let me preface this next verse with this. Sexual intimacy that Paul is speaking of here is only in the context of marriage. It is not common law. It is not, we've been, so lo- we've been together so long, we feel married. Paul says, that's not it. And then listen, there's, I've, I've heard this excuse sometimes from believers. And listen, if you ever hear a believer say, well, it's just a piece of paper. Listen, here's what you can say. Ask them if this is just a piece of paper to them. Because God's word tells us that we should be married if we're going to have that kind of relationship with another person. The marriage that God recognizes is one where there is a ceremony of the exchanging of vows and there are legally married. Amen? Verse 3 tells us, let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her. And likewise, also the wife to her husband. Now, early on in the Bible, you remember back in Genesis chapter 4. In Genesis chapter 4, the Bible introduces us to sex. You remember it says there, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. Now, when you read that, and oftentimes people just say, well, the Bible is so innocent. It just, it says that they knew one another. It just, I, you know, people have this idea that what, you know, the Bible doesn't want to say the word sex. So it says that they knew one another. But the way the Bible introduces us to sex actually describes what is taking place beneath the surface. Allow me to explain. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And it says that they shall become one flesh. Now, becomes indicates there is a process of unity. Because even though there you are, or if you are married, you are you two are one before the Lord and before the province or before the state, there are moments, let's just call them discussions that take place sometimes in a marriage where it feels like there is, there is a division that is taking place or there is an argument happening and it feels like you're divided because there is a process in which we are becoming one before the Lord with our husband or with our wife, our spouse. Now, one of the ways to strengthen the unity is through intimacy. And that's why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and it says becomes one. Now, that word one is the Hebrew word ihad. And it speaks of something that is taking place where there's two individuals literally that are being fused together. And that's what it speaks of. And when you have a sexual relationship with another person and you know them at the deepest levels. And in 1 Corinthians, you remember, that's why Paul warned them in the last chapter, in chapter six, he says, do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her. He says, for the two, he says, shall become one, set, one flesh. 
So that's when the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve knew one another, it's referring to sex, strengthening the bond of unity in the relationship. Now, God created sex not just for breeding, but for a blessing. He created sex not just for procreation, but also for pleasure. And as a way to bring us together in being fused together. Now, with that in mind, notice in verse 4, Paul tells us the attitude that we should have in approaching this aspect of the relationship. He says in verse 4, the, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Thus, so while it is pleasure, it is a pleasure and it is a joy, it also is a responsibility, what Paul is saying. Each person in the relationship is to approach this most sacred area of marriage with the sense of selfless attitude, seeking to bless the other person. And there is giving involved. It is an attitude where my needs are being met, but also I'm desiring to meet the other person's need in the relationship. And it takes a true devotion of giving in the relationship. And maybe... Perhaps you got married and you thought, for example, this person was going to meet all of your needs. And unfortunately, if you have thought that, you've placed an unrealistic expectation upon that individual and that they could never live up to. And now you are perhaps greatly frustrated with them. Well, what do you do? Well, here's what you do. You change your attitude. It's not about always trying to be sexually fulfilled in the relationship, but also trying to fulfill the other person's needs in that. Now, our attitudes as husbands and wives must be that of seeking to render affection, not to ourselves, but to the other person and meet their needs. In verse five, as we continue on, it says, do not deprive one another. Now, notice here, it says, except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to prayer or fasting in prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of the lack of self-control. So what Paul tells us here is there is a difference between spiritual deprivation and sinful deprivation of intimacy. Spiritual deprivation, first of all, is where there is a mutual desire to seek the Lord. And listen, I emphasize there is a mutual desire to seek the Lord. And there is an agreement between the husband and the wife to refrain from intimacy for a period of time. And only, well, this is what one man said, only as long as you can fast. That's what it says here, because you are to be given to prayer and fasting. And thus implying there, often be, there, there should be a short period of time. And the purpose of this type of spiritual deprivation is, I don't want to be with you, I don't want to see you, and that's it. That's not what it's speaking of here, because the focus should be on the Lord during that time. Now, the second thing, way that there is sinful de deprivation. This one is where the enemy destroys the unity through sexual intimacy in marriage. And it is depriving one another from intimacy. Sometimes there are spouses that will use intimacy as a weapon to fight with or try to manipulate the other person rather than a tool to build up the unity of the marriage. And listen, this is wrong. This is not, the, this is not biblical. I, there's times where I've counseled people and they say, well, you know, we're not, you know, the, the, one of the spouses say, well, I wish we had intimacy in our marriage. And the other spouse says, yeah, um, 1 Corinthians 7, you know, we're, uh, we're praying and our focus is on the Lord. And I say, how long has this been going on? Uh, a few years. And I say, are you fasting too? <laughs> you know, during that time? 
Well, no. Well, it says that you should be praying and fasting if that's the case. And listen, and I want to say this lovingly, and in this, this is no way meant to put a guilt trip on your marriage. But your marriage, if you're in a marriage relationship and you're depriving the other person of intimacy, not only is it wrong, it is unbiblical and you should repent and render the affection due to the other person. Now, as we continue on in verse six, it says, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. Now, there's some people that, there's some scholars that say, well, verse six leans back to verse five. And Paul's saying, hey, this isn't a commandment from the Lord, but to me, there's something that's divided. Some half say that it goes back to verse five uh, and half say that it goes forward to verse seven. To me, verse five has a little bit of a force behind it when Paul, he speaks pretty forcefully there. So to me, verse five seems like a commandment. And verse seven, it seems like it's more of Paul, the pastor, giving his opinion. In verse seven, he says, for I wish, and again, he says, I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. He says, I wish that all men were even as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God, one in the manner and another in that. Now, Paul tells us here in verse seven that each one has his own gift. We believe at this point, the apostle Paul is a single man. Now, there are many scholars, and this is my opinion. So you're welcome to take this. You're welcome to say, I don't agree with you. This is my opinion. I want to make this very clear. In the book of Acts, Paul says that he cast his vote. To me, again, this is my opinion, that the apostle Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin uh, giving his vote there. And in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, uh, you would have to be married. So I believe at one point, the apostle Paul was married. Um, you're, that's, you're welcome. And we'll cover more of that. But evidently at this point, he tells us, he says that he was single. He says, I wish they were all as, even as I myself. Now, he tells us that each one has a gift from God. Marriage is a gift from God. But also, singleness is also as much a gift from God. Uh, the Hebrew or the Jewish commentaries on the Old Testament, uh, what the rabbis would give their opinion, they wrote the, the Mishnah and the Talmud. And I'd like to read to you what they said about any, any man who is single. The Mishnah said, any man that has not a wife is no proper man. The Talmud said that God watches to see if a man will be married. And it says, if a man is not married by the, a by the age of 20, the, the, the Talmud said that God says that blasted be his bones. <laughs> That's what man said. Jesus tells us on singleness in Matthew chapter 19, he says, for there are eunuchs that were born thus from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men. And he continues on and he says, he who is able to accept it, let him accept it. You may ask, well, how do I know what gift I have? Well, let me say this. First of all, if you're married, you don't have the gift of singleness. <laughs> you're married. <laughs> Secondly, if you are single and you want to be married, I believe that you probably, have the gift, you probably have the gift of marriage. If you want to be single, then you probably have the gift of being single. And let me say this. If you are single and you desire to be married, God knows your address. He knows where you live. You don't need to go on the prowl. You need to go to prayer. You don't need to go on the hunt. Just uh, you allow the Lord to do a work in you during that time. C.S. Lewis used to say, and I'm trying to remember, I'm, kind of, I'm going to paraphrase this. He used to say, one of the best ways to meet another person and to get married 
He used to say something along the lines of, run to the heart of God, because there at the heart of God, you will find another person that is desiring the heart of God. And that is one of the best things. Also, let me say this, don't rush into it, because it is easier to be single and wanting to be married than to be married and wanting to be single. Stay prayerful, stay patient, and don't compromise by being unequally yoked. Now, as we continue on, if you want to read along with me in verse 10, it says, now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. So Paul's shifting back. He's saying, listen, this is a command from the Lord. The opinions are over, Paul's saying. He says, a wife is not to depart from her husband. But even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And a husband is not to divorce his wife. Now in verse 12, it says, but to the rest, I, not the Lord, say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she is willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. In verse 13, he says, and a woman who has a husband who does not believe he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. And in verse 14, it says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean and now they are holy. Pause right there. What in the world does that mean? What does that mean that the unbeliever can be sanctified by their believing spouse? We looked last week at the sanctifying work and the power, or maybe it was two weeks ago, of the Holy Spirit. Now, to be sanctified, you also have to be justified. And what I mean by that is you have to be cleansed, you have to, be forg- you have to place your faith in the cross and the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. And there Jesus takes your sins. He casts them as far as the east is to the west. And one day we will stand before the throne of the Father. And we will be, ju- and the Bible says that we will be justified just as if we never sinned. That's how God sees us. But as we continued on that week, it says that we are continually being sanctified. And that means we are being transformed day by day into the image of Jesus. So what it, why, why does Paul say here that the unbeliever can be sanctified by the believing spouse? Well, here's what I believe it means. I believe that the believing spouse, because they have been, their hearts have been set on fire by the Lord, they have the ability to set apart, that word sanctify, set apart that unbelieving spouse for a very special and unique work of the Lord Jesus Christ, because they have a front row seat into a city on the hill, if you will, and they can see the good works that God is doing with the good work that God is doing within the believing spouse. And thus, I believe what Paul's saying is that they are set aside specifically for a very unique work. Now, continuing on in verse 16, it says, For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? As we continue into this section, the Apostle Paul is going to address the issue of divorce. Now, in biblical times, divorce was something that was oftentimes practiced by Jewish men, and sadly, practiced often. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, Moses writing, or in Moses gives a command. He says, when a man takes a wife and marries her, it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes. And this is the reason. Because he has found some uncleanness in her, he writes her a bill of divorcement. And it says that he puts it in her hand and sends her out of her house. So of this day, the Jewish males took two different interpretations of this. They had 
one of the rabbis was more of a conservative, had a stricter interpretation of that. And he says, the only uncleanness that it speaks of here is unfaithfulness in adultery to her husband. And he says, at that point, there is the, you have the ability to divorce uh, your wife. The other interpretation was another rabbi who was more liberal and he stated that uncleanness could mean a number of things. Uh, if she burnt your eggs in the morning, well, it's unclean eggs. Write her a bill of divorcement. If she burns the dinner. It, I mean, there were so many different things. If you found her one, if you woke up one morning and you found your wife unattractive, he says, you write her a bill of divorcement. I just... That's, they had just a wild view. And unfortunately, the more liberal view became much more popular in this culture. And that is actually why a dowry was required from the husband when he would come to the wife's father. He would give her a dowry because the father didn't know at one point if the husband was going to try to return the wife. And he had a dowry to ensure that he could financially take care of her. Now, the book of Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 19, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So with that in mind, Paul first addresses divorce here in the church among Christian marriages. Verse 10, he says, now to the married I command, yet not I but he is referencing that of the Lord and he is saying what the Lord said. A wife is not to depart from her husband. Now in Corinthian, in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to two groups of people, married believers as well as a believer married to a non-believer. The first two verses, verse 10 and 11, deal specifically with a married couple that both are believers. And Paul is reiterating what Jesus said in the gospel of Matthew, not to depart from one another. Or in other words, divorce is not an option. Verse 11, he tells us, but even if she departs, he says, let her remain unmarried. And he says, even better yet, be reconciled to her husband. That's what God desires, reconciliation in the marriage relationship. And listen, can I say, if you are in a married relationship and you are having difficulty working through things, there's just been an ongoing argument that is going forth or whatever the case may be. Listen, God desires reconciliation. And listen, that's not condemnation because here's why. God can reconcile a marriage. When there is division between a husband and a wife, it is Jesus Christ himself that can heal the marriage relationship. Look to Jesus in that. Now, secondly, we read in verse 12, what if a believer is married to a non-believer? Well, Paul says, but to the rest, he says, I, not the Lord, say. And I believe that even though Jesus did not specifically cover this circumstance, uh, Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the apostolic authority, gives us instruction in verse 12. He says, if a brother has a wife who does not believe, she is willing to live with him. Paul says, let him not divorce her. Paul says, listen, divorce shouldn't be the option. And Paul tells us very simply, don't divorce. Marriage is a holy union between two people, a husband and a wife, before the Lord, and that is what God designed for a lifetime. Now, notice what possibly might happen. It says in verse 16, he says, for how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Paul is saying, in that because evidently there was a spouse in this church that had the question of, well, I got married as an unbeliever, it would seem, to an unbeliever. Then I got saved. The power and the work of the Holy Spirit started transforming my life. Should I stay with this individual who is not a believer? And Paul says, 
And he tells us here that one of the things that could possibly happen is salvation may come to the unbeliever. And one of the blessings that we, I have seen over the years, I, it is such a miraculous thing. When, listen, when people start praying for an unbelieving spouse, listen, there's times where I've seen an unbelieving spouse, they are so bitter, they are so just filled with hatred for God and the church. But when the church starts praying, there's nothing that that individual t- can do to stop the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. And you never know, God might reach down and snatch his or her soul from the eternity of hell. Listen, church, keep praying. Wives, if you are married to a husband that is an unbeliever, or husbands, if you are married to a wife who is an unbeliever, the one thing that they cannot stop you from is getting on your knees and praying for that individual. Now, in verse 15, it says, if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. He says, a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. And he says, but God has called us to peace. So the Bible gives us two grounds for divorce uh, in the word of God. The first one is if a non-believer, non-believer, emphasis on that, deserts the spouse. Because there are some times, there are some cases where an individual will get saved and in a marriage, and then the spouse will say, man, you're nuts. You're a, you're a Jesus freak now. What happened to you? And then they just leave. It is quite possibly what happened to the Apostle Paul. Because many believe, and I, and I believe, this is my opinion, that the Apostle Paul was married. And in one day he said, honey, I'm going to persecute some Christians. I'm going to go down the Damascus Road, and I'm going to get them. And then Jesus shone the light He shone his light to the apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9. Paul got saved and then he went out for 13 years, was discipled. He grew in the Lord. And then you imagine one day he comes home, a Jesus freak, and his wife says, who who are you? What happened to the guy that was killing Christians? Now you're a Christian. And evidently, I believe that she departed from Paul. Now the er, the other circumstance is that of sexual immorality, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19. He says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, the Lord says they commit adultery. And whoever marries her is, who is divorced commits adultery as well. So this is the only two grounds, uh, in for, biblical grounds for divorce, ad- adultery unfaithfulness, and desertion. Now, one question that is oftentimes posed when you look at this chapter, because the Bible, we also know that the Bible tells us that God hates divorce. And one question that is posed is why does God take marriage and divorce so seriously? And I believe one reason is because a biblical marriage is a picture of Christ in the church, and God does not want that picture distorted in any way. Think about from early on in the Bible, you remember in the book of Genesis, you remember when Adam, the Bible says that God called Adam to fall in a deep sleep, and it says from his side, he received his bride and Eve. John chapter 19 it says when Jesus hung upon the cross and the soldier checked to see after it says that Jesus yielded up his life. No one took Jesus' life. He gave his life. And after he gave his life, it says that the soldier stuck a spear in his side. And you remember that blood and water came out and blood and water is a sign of birth, of a new birth. And from the side of Adam, he received his bride and Eve. From the side of Christ, he received his bride and the church, you and us. God takes marriage and divorce and that picture very seriously. And one of the things that is important, follow me on this, is to put effort into our marriage. Paul says, render the affection due to one another. 
And listen, that speaks of more than just sexual intimacy. Husbands, that speaks of romance. Wives, that speaks of respecting your husband. It speaks of the husband loving the wife as Christ loved the church in Ephesians chapter 5. You know, I remember going one time to someone's house and I saw, and I remember they, they had, she, this, this man, elderly man was restoring a piece of furniture for my wife. And we we're in Florida and I mean, we went, he's like, just drive into the backyard. So he opened the gate for us and we started to drive back there. And I mean, it was just this beautiful, beautiful garden. I was just like, oh my goodness. I was like, I, I can't even drive on your grass. Like this is, he's like, no, just pull it back. I was like, man, I'm not going to drive on your carpet. That's beautiful. Like, that's just, that's beautiful. I'm not going to, I'm not even going to do this. I'll carry it, this piece of furniture over. And I remember asking him, I'm like, how long do you spend out here in your garden? He says, every day. My wife and I are out here every morning. We're pruning. We're taking care of, just watering, fertilizing. My point is this, a garden takes work. Marriage is very much like a garden. It takes effort. And listen, the Bible says that, G, that the father is the vine dresser. And listen, he will do that work in a marriage. And listen, you know, sometimes it's painful. Listen, as a husband, sometimes I have to surrender to the Lord. He says, hey, we're going to prune this off in your life. Ah, that's how sharp's the blade, Lord? <laughs> it's sharp, but this needs to go. And sometimes marriage needs pruning. And then there can be growth in the marriage. Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, your word tells us by your stripes, your stripes, Lord Jesus, that we are healed. And Lord, for marriages this morning that need healing. Lord, for people that are single, desire to, that, to be married, and there's wounds from that. Lord God, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would heal, Lord Jesus. Lord, prune us. Help us grow, Lord Jesus. We need your grace, Lord God. Pray that you would pour out your grace and your mercy on marriages, Lord, that need healing. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your work, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Would you stand with me?